Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. He also told them this parable to some, or told the parable to some, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us in the truth. Your holy word is truth. Amen. Jesus sets the scene for this parable. The scene is set with his final words from the parable before, of the parable of the persistent widow who never gives up crying out for justice. And his final words at the end of this parable are, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Jesus then sets the scene with the arrival of two men at the temple. He, the Son of Man, allows us to take his place to see if we find faith on earth through this parable. In it, we get to examine the faith posture of two persons who have come to the temple in Jerusalem. Now this is all set up around temple worship. This is not about individual prayer, even though we hear their individual prayers. This temple worship was the daily atonement sacrifice for the people of Israel. Temple worship here was that daily sacrifice. Jesus gives us a very privileged petition of hearing the faith of the Pharisee and the tax collector but who are these two characters? One is socially acceptable individual in the person of the Pharisee. This is a good person in the eyes of the public. He's very eloquent in his speech. He's a law-abiding citizen or a good bloke, one might say. The other man is sociably, socially, I should say, objectionable in the form of the tax collector. He's a bad person, a rogue, a scoundrel, a lawbreaker, an extortioner, an enemy of the state, one who works against the common good. Against the background of public thanksgiving for the, the daily atonement sacrifice through the priestly sacrifices of animals on the altar to take away the sins of the nation of Israel, Jesus gives us the privileged position of hearing the private prayers of both men in this public gathering. The Pharisee's posture is opposite to that of the tax collector. I, I, I. I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. I, I, I. The tax collector beats the heart of his sinful being from where his extortion, unrighteousness or unjustness, 
adultery, and unacceptability breeds loneliness, contempt for himself, separation from God and from others. He cries out to God, Be merciful to me, a sinner, or literally, make atonement for me. One who misses the ability to atone for myself. In this parable, Jesus gives you a front row seat in finding the faith of these two. Now it's obvious that the faith of the tax collector was firmly ground in the fact that he was a sinner and could not atone for himself through acting good or bad. No, this was no act of false humility, appearing bad to be good or good to be bad. He knew his sin, if it was to be atoned for, had to be atoned for by an act of mercy on the part of God. Whereas the Pharisee, he had great faith. He had great faith. However, his faith was in himself and what he did. Separating and placing himself apart from those whom he thought were below him. Now Jesus has given you access into the heart of these two. Which one are you in this parable? Okay, that's the first scene. Second scene, as we ponder who we are in the parable, the Holy Spirit paints a picture of you here in this congregation. When you got out of bed this morning, what were your thoughts about coming to church today? Do I really have to go? You may have asked yourself. I hope such and such is not there today or I hope others are there. I don't feel like it's church unless such and such is there. I, 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 yet again, you hear. I want more modern songs. I want more older hymns. I want, I want, I want. Jesus looks on. Will he find faith at church? Here today. Perhaps your soul longs for the courts of the Lord. You love to dwell in the hearing of his word, receiving the forgiveness of sins as you confess and receive absolution and the reception of Jesus' body and blood for your life and salvation. But as you do, you receive resistance from others who seek to hinder you from coming to dwell in God's atonement through word and sacraments. And then maybe you have come to observe, you think, good sermon, pastor, great service, they really needed to hear it. Or weighed down by the weight of your sin, you think, if only I could stop doing that thing or stop acting this way, I would be a better person. Maybe you imagine if I was more like that person over there, I would be more acceptable before others, before God. So I'll act humble or I'll act in a certain way to appear as something different. There are those who live on one hand as if their goodness is too good for God. And there are those who believe their badness is too evil for God. But then there are the faithful who focus not on their good or their evil, but on Jesus Christ, knowing they're sinners, being forgiven. And they're seated amongst likewise sinners, being forgiven. Together they collectively beat their chest and cry out for mercy. They look for knowledge outside themselves for the atonement 
of their sin. In the knowledge of Jesus Christ, they cherish and find the means of freedom from themselves. They live with a steadfast struggle, feverishly fighting that Pharisee within. The old man within who seeks resurrection again after sins have been forgiven. He seeks to turn the repentant tax collector within into a Pharisee, going out once again to maintain the separation from those from whom they are glad they are not like. Jesus watches on as we picture ourselves in the parable. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The reality in our knowledge of Jesus Christ is that we all have within us another tendency to be both a Pharisee and a tax collector. That is, we practice a good or a bad faith in oneself rather than practicing faith in God for our atonement. We come as sinners each week and there is a real temptation to leave as Pharisees and return as Pharisees next week. Such is our human nature, we are tempted into a posture of praying and practicing, saying, God, I thank you that I am not like that Pharisee, as well as a tax collector. With a holy spirited knowledge of Jesus Christ in submission to God's word, revelation of our sinfulness and the covering of sin in Jesus' death and resurrection, we can truly pray, thank you, Heavenly Father, that being like all others, you have saved and redeemed me, a lost and condemned person. You and I can then go and serve both the Pharisee and the tax collector, knowing that without Jesus Christ, we suffer from self-righteousness or unrighteousness. Or to put it another way, without Jesus Christ, we die from the sin of believing that we are not sinners or from the sins we know that we cannot put right by ourselves. We lovingly serve the Pharisee and the tax collector knowing that without Jesus' love, we are the Pharisee and the tax collector. The law faker and the law breaker. The socially acceptable hypocrite and the socially acceptable undesirable. Scene three, as we leave this place and travel toward the cross in our lives, and we all travel towards a cross in our lives, do you stubbornly set your face towards knowledge of your good and evil? Or do you purposefully set your face towards knowledge of Jesus Christ? As he did towards you, and the atonement of your sins when he resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Jesus quite clearly says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Not might be, but will be. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Scene three plays out on the stage of eternity. In fact, the old covenant temple worship, the new covenant worship of Jesus Christ, have been prerequisites for our recreation and recreation, eternal recreation with God the Father, Son 
and Holy Spirit. The Son of Man will come once and for all. But he also comes to us now. The faith he seeks in us is the humble willingness to be served by this Son of Man, to have faith and trust in his faithfulness to us. Despite the Pharisee and the tax collector within each of us. He calls us to humbly run the race in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in our haughty human spirit, which fails to follow in the strength of Jesus' seemingly weak walk to the cross. Running in the Holy Spirit has its victory in the Son of Man's exaltation from servant to the king of creation. This Son of Man is also the risen Son of God who serves us with his Holy Spirit, who fights the good fight within and with the world without our worry and work. Jesus Christ, both Son of God and Son of Man, in true humility is now exalted at the right hand of the Father. Likewise, our humility will see us in the third eternal act, exalted with Jesus Christ in eternity. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.